Lemonada. On June 6, 1968, I saw my stepdad, who I call Daddy Tom, cry uncontrollably for the first time. Actually, I think really for the only time. It was in the morning, and he was standing up in the bedroom, hugging my mother, and I remember just staring at them. It was pretty terrifying. They had just gotten the news that Robert Kennedy had been assassinated the night before. My parents were huge believers in Bobby Kennedy's ideology, and they were completely devastated by his loss. I was, well, I guess, about seven, so I didn't understand all of the political stuff, of course, you know, the war and civil rights and social justice. I just saw my dad crying. But I really clocked it. In my family, politics was gigantically emotional. My other father, my biological father, William, whom I call Daddy Will, he had this huge framed black and white photograph of Martin Luther King Jr. above the fireplace. And just to put this in context so you understand, he was an avid art collector, okay? He had some significant paintings. But in that prime spot of the house, there was just this huge photo of Martin Luther King. That was the art. That is how meaningful Martin Luther King Jr. was to him. Oh, and also, my daddy Will was on Nixon's enemies list. Can you believe that? He was so proud of that. For him, being an enemy of the soon-to-be-disgraced president was a ginormous accomplishment, you know? They printed the enemies list in the Wichita Eagle and Beacon newspaper, and my dad framed it, and he put it up in his office as a badge of honor, a triumph, you know? He's since passed, so now I am the very proud owner of that fabulous artifact. I didn't really think about it as a kid growing up, but of course, I was surrounded by politics in Washington, D.C., obviously. I mean, I went to a super conservative all-girls school. It wasn't a Christian school or anything, but it felt kind of like that to me as a short, dark, curly-haired liberal named Dreyfus. The place was so Republican. I mean, President Ford's daughter, Susan, went there. She was way older than me, but I remember her Secret Service agents. They were in the halls, and she had her senior prom at the White House. God. Actually, um, come to think of it, the main weed dealer at my high school was— um, how do I put this so I don't get sued— uh, she was the daughter of someone from the Justice Department. Yeah, yeah. Politics was just everywhere for me. The first election that I voted in was Carter versus Reagan, so I was a righteous loser from the start. And I, I still can't shake this emotional political thing. I hear the national anthem, and I get a little choked up. But politics is how we change things in this hugely flawed, wonderful country, democracy, the right to vote. You know, that is huge. And it's sacred. When my kids were really tiny, when they were, they were too tiny to have any idea what the fuck was going on, I would take them with me to the polling place and I'd march them into the booth so they could punch the buttons for me. I don't know, maybe that's illegal, but I did it. I thought it was important. It was a good message for them. And they thought it was fun. When I started to get famous, it gave me a platform to help shine the spotlight on candidates and issues that I thought were legitimate. And so I started to do that. And I know there's a lot of blowback on celebrities for getting involved in politics, but my philosophy on that is this. I'm a citizen of the United States. I love this country. I'm allowed to express my views. And I never claim to be an expert on any issue. But if people want to listen to me, I'm delighted to use that moment to bring attention to the people who deserve to be heard. And when it comes to the environment and the climate crisis, boy, does Gina McCarthy deserve to be heard. So today, I'm talking to Gina McCarthy. I'm Julia Louis-Dreyfus. This is Wiser Than Me, the podcast where I get schooled by women who are wiser than me. Holy 
hell, you guys, today is going to blow your goddamn minds. You know, I really do believe that the climate crisis is the elephant in every room. It's a social justice issue. It's a national security issue. It's a racial issue. It's an economic issue. It is the ticking time bomb that could, in fact, destroy mankind. And our guest, Gina McCarthy, is out there trying to defuse that fucking time bomb every day. She's like the MacGyver of climate. She's fought inside the system, serving in both Republican and Democratic administrations. I mean, give me a break. How hard is that? We need to find out about that. And I can't even list all the shit she's done for the environment, but here are some greatest hits. She was head of the EPA in the Obama administration. She was the first ever national climate advisor in the Biden administration. She ran the Natural Resources Defense Council, the folks who sue the government's ass and who sue climate criminals and who win. She's had to testify in front of the worst climate deniers in Congress. Can't wait to hear about that. And somehow she just keeps on fighting in spite of impossible odds and under the threat of global extinction, for fuck's sake. She's controversial. She's powerful. She's smart as a whip. She's a wife. She's a mother. And she's got the best Boston accent ever. And she's definitely wiser than me. Gina, I am so happy to get to talk to you today, Gina McCarthy. Julia, what an introduction. I'm really nervous now. How am I going to live up to all that? Yeah, we can just end the interview now if you'd like. <laughs> It would definitely be to my benefit, but we'll risk it anyways and go ahead. <laughs> so um, before we start talking, first of all, are you comfortable if I say your real age? Are you cool with that? Of course, yeah. All right. So you just turned 69, right? That's right. And how old do you feel, Gina, on the inside? How do you feel age-wise? I would say somewhere around 32. I still think I probably am somewhere like that until I look in the mirror, of course, but I can fool myself for long periods of time. We can all say you're 32. If you want, I'll ask you again. <laughs> What's your real age? I'm 32. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So listen, here's my first question. Do you consider yourself a politician? No, not at all. Why? I think there's a big difference between a big P politician and somebody that is you know, in, in politics, small p. You know, I've worked in government my entire life, so I've been surrounded in working for people who are elected. And I like policy. I like the give and take of making decisions based on real facts and science and, and trying to move those things forward. I don't like, you know, the scrappiness of the of the whole thing when you're in the big P politics and Lord knows I I would hate going around shaking hands and doing all that kind of stuff all the time right. every two to four years it just seems miserable to me that you're running more than you're serving you know I don't, I wouldn't like that at all speaking for myself as somebody who's who's been the only woman in the room more times than I care to admit. I mean, whether it's in a writer's room or yeah. whether it's, you know, on TV in a cast, whatever. I know you've had similar experience yourself. Yeah. So let's talk about that. What's that been like for you, if that's been your experience? In a number of ways that that has been. It's certainly gotten better over time. But honestly, I talk to a lot of, of young women about that now, you know, because I watch them, how they behave in a meeting, you know. And, and really, over time, I think you just learn um, that you, you sit forward and you speak up, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if you speak up and people don't like it, I speak up again if I think something Thing still needs to be said. Uh, but it's gotten better. I mean, I, I don't think it's anywhere near where it used to be. You know, I, I remember when I was younger, I got stuck sort of chairing this statewide board many years ago. I think I was probably 28 years old at the time, may, maybe 30. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was at a public hearing 
And it was a very contentious issue because it was a hazardous waste facility site safety council. So it was about an incinerator being sited in a community. And so every time you went to a public hearing, you had to have police escorts in and out. And so I was chairing this meeting and it was raucous. But this one guy came up and I called on him and he he walked up sort of the front where we were sitting on a table as the board. He's and, he was like a citizen yeah, in the community, he was. you mean? And uh-huh. he said, and he sort of stood, leaned forward and started to say, hey, sweetheart. And oh. I jumped up, <laughs> practically jumped over the table, and I said, <gasps> don't call me sweetheart. Please tell me people applauded. Wait, well, it was, on, it was on the news that night. It was a reaction, not a well-thought-out answer, but it made its point. You know, he backed up and he politely asked questions, which was great. And actually, that was a very contentious issue that ended up not citing the incinerator. And Mm. uh, the folks in that community were actually very appreciative of the way that we handled it. You know, so it it just, you know, you just got to go with the flow, but also recognize that, you, you know, there's a ground you need to keep as a human being. There's a respect that you need to demand, right. especially in, in political situations. Yeah, and especially as a woman. That's right? right. You do. Right. Yeah. Which leads me into this next thing I wanted to talk about, which was, you know, in, in 2008, do you remember when Hillary got famously emotional? Uh, she was doing a town hall somewhere and she teared up. And there was a lot of controversy about it because, first of all, her approval numbers went up. And some people thought that was a good thing and others criticized it because it was, you know, a woman tearing up on the campaign trail. And as a matter of fact, it was something that when we took and sort of ran with on Veep, when we were making Veep the first season, we actually had an episode called Tears written by Jesse Armstrong, who now runs the show Succession, by the way. And in this particular episode, my character of Selena Meyer gets emotional during an interview only because her staff has negotiated with the journalist to make the journalist ask Selena Meyer questions to make her cry (laughs) in an effort to get her approval ratings up. Can you imagine, Felicia, if, if I'm tired? Imagine how tired the rubber makers are here in Ohio. She is magnificent. I won an Emmy for that, so that worked out good for me. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I want to know something. Are you an emotional person? I mean, you stand up and you say, don't call me sweetheart. Yeah. But I don't know if that makes you an emotional person. I Are you? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it makes me less than stable. I don't know. In situations like that, you know, I, I, I really feel like uh, I disarm people by being very genuine. <laughs> I don't get excited about the situation I'm in. You know, I I feel like um, I handle myself well. So I just talk normal and I behave normally. And certainly there are things that, you know, get very upsetting, but not someone calling me sweetheart. You know, that was just a reaction. It would have to be a whole lot more than that to get me to to be uh, emotional in other than a private setting. And frankly, I don't, you know, I don't tend to be... Um, a very weepy person, but I don't find. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna make you cry. Okay, good. Give it a go, and you're not gonna like pinch me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question: What's the best advice you received in your career? Did you ever get really good advice from someone that you sort of took with you that you've taken with you along your way? Yeah, I did. I did. I got. Uh, uh, there's this one thing that sticks up out in my mind and. And it was just a little bit of a push as much of an advice as when I was in Massachusetts, one of the things that I did uh, early on in, um, in my career, well, mid-career anyways, I was working on how to get rid of the five remaining coal-fired power plants in the state. 
the governor had said he was going to do it. Now I was on the third governor trying to get it done, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it took that long to get this done. And we had a lot of push. I had a lot of pushback at internal meetings. I left the meeting and I was walking with the then chief of staff of environmental affairs office. And I said to him, you know, I'm so sick and tired of this. We've gone to three or four of these meetings. I I just want to call the question here. Let's just put it on the table and see if the governor will step up. And he said something very casual, like, Gina, you never push the question if the answer is going to be no. Uh. (laughs) And he looked at the politics and said, keep plugging because it will break. But if you try too soon... If you push Mm -hmm. too hard and because you're frustrated, not because you found a way to argue something different, then you're going to lose. So every time from then that when I've hit a wall, I've thought to myself, well, what's the other way to get at it? What do I keep? What do I do different? Right. That's going to start a separate conversation that can get me where I need to go. That's the small P politician in you. Am I right? Yeah, because it's pe- it's people. Uh, you know, I'm not yeah. really fighting for a political ideation or idea. It's right. that's not where I am. I don't care no. whether it was a good idea by a Republican or a Democrat. If it's a good idea and I can save lives, I can make things better, clean up places. I'm going to go for it. Well, speaking of which, then, yeah. so you work for Democrats and Republicans, I do. of course. I don't know how you managed to go between the two, particularly in the last. I'm going to say five years. I do not know how you've done it because I can tell you right now, I'd want to blow my brains out <laughs> over these fucking lunatics. Really? I mean, I want to know. And and for speaking for myself, particularly when I get angry, I um, it's very hard for me to put a sentence together. I get so pissed off that I can't speak articulately. I sense that you are not like this. I know that you are not like this. How, how do you do it? How do you stay calm? How do you keep from, forgive me, but murdering Joe Manchin? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) That would have been highly unsuccessful strategy. Uh, um, (laughs) Well, let's, let's not forget that Manchin was a Democrat or is a Democrat. Yes. It's hard to remember that. I guess we it have is. to pinch ourselves and call out, call that out every <laughs> once in a while. You know, my mother had this saying that always rings through for me, and I say it to my kids and it drives them crazy. It's basically don't waste a good worry on things you can't control. Oh, that's such good advice. Which I think is the in government, if you don't take a deep breath Mm. on things that you can't change, you'll drive yourself friggin' nuts. Right. And I, I did for a while when I was younger, but I don't do that anymore. I have to find a different way to get to the outcome I want. So when, you know, I I did more hearings, me and uh, Tom Perez, it was a labor secretary under Obama. And when I was EPA yeah. administrator, we were competing for who was hauled up in front of Congress more. But, it, you know, you just had to sit there and recognize that this is not your show. This is mm-hmm. their show. The only thing you had to do was stay polite, tell the truth. If they didn't like the truth, they'd say something else. You'd still mm-hmm. answer the question and you mm-hmm. just keep moving on because a lot of, you know, what happens at the federal level and in politics is bluster. Right. You know, and, and, and if you can't take that, don't go in. Mm-hmm. You know, because that you have to desensitize yourself to that. But still, you know, you still have to respect people. They won. So you do what you can to be as respectful as you can. But you don't ever have to agree and you don't ever have to try to bounce back and be as nasty to someone as they are to you. It's the worst thing in the world, especially for a woman. That's not the atmosphere in w- within which you can win. Doesn't that suck? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you say that, especially for a woman. I can't, I mean, the idea of stooping to their level, the blustery level, is just, uh, that's off the table for you as a woman. Yeah. But that's what they were looking to do, right? That's what they wanted. Yeah, that's the trap. 
That's the trap. So I keep saying, you know, I, I just sat there going, okay, Jeannie, you're going to leave here and, and you're not going to make one single story. They just wasted their time on you. Right. That's what I wanted because it, it's, it was certainly not my goal to defend life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness in front of, you know, con- senators that throw snowballs and say climate change isn't happening. I mean, seriously. Well, speaking of which, I will tell you this story on myself, because back you know, over 20 years ago, I remember Lori David, uh, whom, whom you know, and I know, of course. I do. Um, she came to me and she was thinking she was going to do a documentary about global warming, which ultimately turned into an inconvenient truth and won an Academy Award. But she says this to me, and I'm like, you know what? I don't think anybody's going to buy that. <laughs> So that was my, that's, that's what a complete idiot I was. I mean, I really did think it was just too big, too big an idea to present to uh, the American movie going audience, you know, or shall I say a global movie going audience. So what did I know? But anyway, it, have you always been on this, on the climate train? And, no. and yeah. uh, how did you come around to it yourself? You know, I had a woman that I, I worked with and uh, when I was in the environmental agency in Massachusetts who was an air quality person, and she, yeah. she spotted it early um, and really kept pushing me and pushing me to start getting more active on climate. we got to talk about it. And so I, I really got very active when we started looking at something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Mm. which is was the first cap and trade program in New England and uh, the mid-Atlantic states. It's now 11 states. That was a, a really big thing for me. And it was the, you know, the first time I started to get a real sense of the dynamics of this issue um, and all the various ways that you could really start thinking about managing it and addressing it. You know, I obviously, I don't have your expertise on the climate crisis, but I certainly understand the gravity of this issue and the scale of it. And I can't imagine what it's like to take on something so huge and to have the responsibility that you had. And when my son, Henry, was in in fourth grade, he had a teacher named Christy, whom we adored. And she used to say to Henry and to the kids, when they were feeling overwhelmed by whatever, you know, a math test or a little essay or something they had to write, whatever, she would say, take it in manageable parts, yeah. break it down into manageable parts. And it reminds me of something that you said that I have here. You said, I just don't think there's anything we can't do when we begin to take those small steps, because when you do, big steps follow. Yeah, that's right. And it reminded me of Christy. Yeah. It's the same idea, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I- I think, and this is a really important thing, I think, maybe for your listeners and others to think about, is yeah. when you have a big lift that you're trying to get, you yeah. take it in five-pound weights, right? Oh, you have to just start somewhere. I've, I've seen it m- my whole life. It's been amazing. The Regional Greenhouse Gas in- Initiative was huge. No one could do it. Blah, 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 blah. Then you got a s- couple of states who can. And then all of a sudden, oh, this actually works. More states join. You know, it just happens. Yeah. But you, you, you can't always, with big things, know how to get them done. You just know you have to start. I think people worry too much about plans to the finish. I see it all the time. Well, that'll only get you halfway there. I'm like, well, who gives a shit? Halfway is halfway further than I am now. Right, exactly. (laughs) We'll get more wisdom from Gina McCarthy after this break. Stay tuned. You know that feeling when you try on a new article of clothing and it just checks all of the boxes? It's that new sweater, that new pair of jeans or those shoes. It somehow just does something different for you. When I find a brand that knows how to pull off that delicate balance of effortless and put together, I'm a fan for life. Let me tell you about a little secret in women's apparel that 
you've maybe never heard of that will become your new go-to place to shop. EverEve is a retailer of women's apparel, accessories, and footwear, thoughtfully curated for fashion-forward women who are older and wiser. They have 96 stores across 33 states and offer an easy-to-use online store that you can browse for ages. One of the best ways to browse Ever Eve's site is to visit their Shop the Formula site, which has put together looks pre-styled with links to every item on their site. You can grab your top, shoes, and accessories all in one go. It's such a fun and easy way to visualize a look and then grab all the pieces you need, whether you're shopping for an upcoming vacation, a summer wedding, or more. So go to evereve.com and you'll see what I mean about their online experience. I mean, wait a minute, don't do it right now. I'm still talking. But after you're done listening to this podcast, then go visit Evereve to experience it yourself. Check out Evereve's latest curated styles and get 20% off your first online order when you use promo code WISER at evereve.com. That's Evereve, E-V-E-R-E-V-E. Dot com. Promo code WISER. We all love to talk about our hair, and people ask me about mine all the time. I often use the opportunity to talk about how we can protect the environment through our shampoo choices. Eco-conscious is the new glamorous. And how great is it when you find a brand like Hair Story that is both eco-conscious and glamorous? They know that traditional shampoo is actually not great for your hair, and the impact of shampoo bottles on the environment isn't either. Hair Story is best known for its hero product, New Wash, the first of its kind custom formula that cleans, conditions, detangles, and restores hair without harsh foams and damaging detergents found in traditional shampoos. The luxurious result, your healthiest, happiest hair ever. Also, Hair Story donates 1% of their 8-ounce new wash sales to water-related issues. I love brands that can show their commitment to the environment in really tangible ways. Plus, New Wash is 100% biodegradable and comes in 100% recyclable pouch packaging, helping you avoid contributing to the 500 million plastic shampoo bottles that are discarded each year. I love knowing that the company is doing what's best, not just for hair health, but also for the environment. We could all be more conscious of what we're buying, and shampoo is no exception. Try New Wash. Have your best hair day every day and support the environment by going to hairstory.com. Plus, if you use code WISER at checkout, Hair Story will donate 10% to water preservation efforts and you'll enjoy 20% off your purchase. That's hairstory.com. Use code WISER. I love accessories because they can really make an outfit. And isn't it frustrating that we have to commit to just one or two eyewear frames? At least that's how it used to be. But now there's pair eyewear. Pair eyewear lets you customize your eyeglasses, switching up your style in a snap. The way it works is they offer you a base frame and customizable magnetic topper frames. That means you can change up your look every single day from classic to trendy to zany and back. They can even make toppers that help you cheer on your favorite sports team during game days. You'll love being able to change out your look easily with your new pair eyeglass frames. And Pear Eyewear offers glasses for the whole family. Just think about how your kids will enjoy getting to express their personalities, selecting their favorite color or topper frame throughout the week. Or you, you'd enjoy that too. They even have sunglasses. You know, I love brands that actually try to make a difference in the world, and Pear does that too. For every pair you buy, Pear provides glasses to a child in need. Bring more color into your world this spring with Pear Eyewear. Go to PearEyewear.com slash Wiser for 15% off your first purchase. That's Pear, P-A-I-R, Eyewear.com slash Wiser. Can we talk about Flint? Mm-hmm. I know you took a lot of criticism about the Flint water crisis. And yep. actually, one of our producers is a black woman, and we were watching the hearings that you went through. And when she described what it was like watching the Senate hearings, she said that the woman part of her was cheering for you. But the black part of her was very let down. Yeah. And so I'm wondering today, what would you say to those black people, that community who felt disillusioned and disenfranchised by the whole thing, by that 
crisis? Well, I certainly won't challenge how she feels. Um, if right. I were her, I probably would have felt the same way. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a couple of things. One is that entire city had been let down for decades. Mm-hmm. And we did nothing at EPA to help with that. Very, very little. We mm-hmm. didn't jump on it quickly. We didn't recognize what the community was saying. We were just listening to, at then, the, they had this emergency uh, supervisor, I forget what the term was, that was running Flint because the, basically the state took it over. And they didn't tell us the truth. And we just didn't push fast enough. Now, I know that that at headquarters, when we figured this out, we jumped. We had people there the next day. We had emergency services set up for the for years after that. But it, it was a horrendous situation. And so what that hearing was about, though, was a couple of things. It was about, obviously, getting the information out. But the challenging part is whenever a problem like that happens, everybody wants to land on someone to blame. It's it's human nature. And so I I had to take uh, and make sure that everybody knew about the disappointment we had at EPA with our performance and not listening quickly. But mm-hmm. but I but it, it was a horrible situation. And I don't blame anybody for for, you know, resenting that or feeling like we let them down because I don't think I feel any differently. Every time it's brought up, I have a pit in my stomach. It seemed to me during the hearing, when mm-hmm. I was watching it, the footage, it seemed to me like you, you were biting your tongue a lot during that yeah, hearing. I was. Right. And actually, back to Veep again, we used to meet with politicians and people in government and lobbyists and all sorts of things. And when I say we, I mean me and the writers and stuff. And one of those people was Mitt Romney. He came yeah. to talk to our writer's room. And he was incredibly generous to do so. And he hung out for a really long time. And we asked him about his 47% gaffe that he made when he was running for president. And it was an incredible gaffe. And it it was sort of, I think, the beginning of the end of his, his run yeah. for president yeah. to a certain extent. And we were asking him about that and how he managed that moment, what it was like. And what he said to us was, you know, when you're explaining, you're losing, he said which is an actual line then we put into the show. What happened to you during that hearing that kept you from saying what maybe you wanted to say and what did you want to say? Well, you know, the the awkwardness of that hearing, what it was not... And that that Shavitz, I mean, give me a fucking break. I know. The awkwardness was that I was sitting next to the governor. Now, the governor had all the culpability in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. The state, which we now know because the state's the one that's been sued. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that have had to pay because it was their responsibility to tell us the truth. And Mm -hmm. they didn't. So I think he went first and then I went next. And so you make your case. But, you know, I really kind of wanted to whack him one. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, seriously. Yes. I I was I I tried my best to, yes, explain, because in government, you, you're supposed to explain. You're supposed to explain what you did, what you didn't do, how you thought about it. Maybe that's losing, but to me, that's governance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's leadership. I tell. Right, right. You know, and right, so right. we took culpability to the extent that, that I, I tried hard to make sure that people knew that we should not be without criticism. We are not without blame. But to have that guy start out by saying it was our fault, well, that was where I was biting my tongue. I because see. I, you know, it that would have done nobody any good. And frankly, I, I think the people were much more interested in getting justice than they were revenge. You know, I want to shift gears now. Thank you for that. And thank you for speaking so in depth about that crisis in particular. So but now I'm changing yeah. gears okay. completely. I want to ask you something. Okay. You have three children, yes. right? Yes. You had three children in three years. I did. Had you not heard about something called birth control? <laughs> uh, yes. I think I just got overly excited. I'm sorry. Clearly. 
<laughs> Those were fun years, I'm telling you. I were had my they? first when I was 30. Oh my God, they were great. They were crazy. Yeah, crazy, exactly. Crazy. How did you do it? Because you had a career. You were working, were you not? I was, I was. So I had my first when I was the health agent in Canton. That was a full-time job. And I had a, a lovely friend who was in the same town who sat for my, my child um, okay. after like he was three months old or so. And so I got, I went back to work and, and I kept that job up for a while, which was great. Um, then I just, I got pregnant again. And then I decided I probably should take a little bit of time with this baby, which I did. But then I got really bored. <laughs> so you got pregnant again. So, no. So I went back to work <laughs> uh, and then I got pregnant again. Uh, so it, it was, it, but the, the, the way it worked was, you know, my husband's really terrific. He's, he's just a, a great person and he was in the flower business. Yeah. And here's how our schedules worked. Please. So he he would go in. There's there's a flower market in the city where he had to go in and buy flowers because he bought them for supermarkets. That was his job then, and he'd go in at like three in the morning, two or of three course. in the morning. That's when his day started, and he'd get home at two, and I'd go to work then, Got and I'd it. go to work for like three hours or four hours in in the job, and then I'd take home a box of plans. That, that other people didn't have time to look at, and I'd work till 10 at night. At home? At home. So it was like tag team parenting it is was. how you did it. That's it. Yep. Wow. Um, so it was, wow. it was really fun. And not seeing one another a lot was how I avoided the fourth, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Four and four years would have been the death of me. That would have been, that's a lot. But I had, you know, I I also had a sister-in-law who had two kids uh, not too long after mine. So when my kids were like, uh, you know, three and four and five, I had a lot of help. Family's great. The family was around because your mother also worked, right? I mean, she she oh, yeah. worked while raising you and your sister. She did. Correct? She was a waitress, uh-huh. and and then she was a nurse's aide, and she worked in a, a chemical company for a while. Mm. So she was great. I think I learned to live with less sleep than most human beings, and I think right. I got that from her. I love the attitude about it. I have to say, when I was when I was having my kids. And I spaced them out, right? I spaced their um, five years apart. But even having them spaced apart, I was like dying. I wish, actually looking back on it, I wish I'd been, uh, I could have taken a big fat chill pill during that time because I was so anxious about being there for them. And then also when I had to get to work and it doesn't sound like you suffered that at all. Not as not as bad, but it, you know, I told you I don't waste a good worry. I mean, I just yeah. don't do that because it's so draining. So it all works out. You just got to make it happen. And honestly, having someone like my husband was really made it all happen. You know, it's always been challenging, but he always knew that I was never going to be a person who didn't want to work. It's yes. just in my blood. Yeah. You know, I I love having a purpose and yes. and it's great to have your purpose be motherhood and many people are satisfied with that and happy it just wasn't me and so he knew when I said I was going to take some time off after the second that I probably wouldn't he knew that. I, I built a, a really <laughs> actually I built a really terrific swing set <laughs> And I built a really terrific little little house in the back for the kids to play in. God, I really, I really wish I'd known you when I was a young mother. I could have used, I could have used your handiwork. I could have used a swing set in the backyard. <laughs> hey, when did your hair start to go gray? Oh, when I was about thirteen. Get the fuck out of here! I was significantly gray in high school. No. And it, and I really loved it because it was like so different. Of I course, like have no, I have a grown up with literally no style, right? I mean, I just wear <laughs> jeans whenever I can get away with it, and if it's not jeans, it's just a really cheap pair of pants, and maybe I can find some kind of jacket to go over it. You know, I just can't. It's just not what I do. I suck at that stuff, but I loved my gray hair. It always gave me something probably to detract from my clothes, so it was great. But um, but then then when you grow into an age where 
it's not a surprise anymore, then it's like, oh, shit. You know, right. it gives me no distinguishing feature. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good color. It is, for real. It's totally white. It's ridiculous. I have to tell you that I started graying at a very young age, too, but I started, I've been dying it my whole life. At some point, I got to let this at go. Like how old? Probably about in my early 20s. Yeah. My, yeah. my daughter's like that. My oldest really? daughter, Maggie. Yeah. And she's not pleased with it. <laughs> is she dyeing her hair? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she colors it. Because it, it, if she doesn't, it starts getting this gray thing. I had kind of a, a, a brown, light brown hair. So it was boring without the gray. And it mixed in well. It wasn't startling at first, so it grew in. But Maggie's hair is much darker than mine. Oh. And so it looked, and I would agree with her. I, I totally would have done the same thing if I were her. <laughs> But what do you do, like, if you have to go to an event or something, do you get somebody to help you with your with your outfit choices, or you oh, just shit, wear no. the pants I and don't the jacket? Ha- really. If I actually hired somebody to look through my choices, they'd only have to work for about five minutes or so. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's either the gray suit or the blue suit. You know what I mean? It's just, uh-huh. I- I'm really bad. I'm trying to be better, but I don't think I ever will be. Yeah, I don't think you're changing in this area. No. <laughs> So all of these high-powered jobs that you've had throughout your career, I want to know, how do you take care of yourself in the middle of all of that? You know, do you have like any sort of a, you know, they call it self-care, but do you have, what do you do for yourself? I do, I do do think I take care of myself. You know, when I was a kid, we sort of grew up outside. Yeah. So being outside and walking or biking and in my younger years running, and it was absolutely essential. You know, I always swam a lot. I'm, I'm a pretty good swimmer. Oh, really? Do you still swim? Not not of the past couple of years. I, I should, but I just haven't had time. The White House is a horse of a different color, I'll tell you. Right. Oof, they're Don't like they have a pool the in the White House you can <laughs> pop into? And you know what I really do? Every, every night, um, and this has been a habit of mine, I think, for a really long time, is I, I read a book. I, I have oh. to. That's how my, I get my mind off of things, you know? And it's, mm. I've always read mystery books. Because really? I can read them and I can put them down. You know, a novel I read, I read every once in a while, but they're intense. They're all personal. And I'm like, I don't need any more drama in my life. <laughs> yeah, I you just, just want to know something. who done it. Exactly. And so what are you reading now? What are you reading? Oh, I am reading something by Karen Slaughter, which is a more intense book than I thought. I'll tell you, my favorite author tell me. is Louise Penny. Louise Penny. She okay. does the Gamache books. It's a mystery. It's it, and it can be complex, and and it's. I think she's on her maybe twelfth book. Lord. And I've read every single one of them. And I thought I was the only freak that was obsessed with this woman. I have her on my Kindle as I'll buy anything this woman writes. She just did a book with Hillary Clinton. Oh, she's the one who did the book with Hillary Clinton. Oh my god! I don't know what it is. But I, but I, I'm just fascinated with the woman and the way she writes. Are you in a book club? No, I've never done that. I don't I do did a it, lot I of those I did it kinds. once. It was too much pressure to finish the book and then, <laughs> and then have an opinion. I, I like to go at my own rate. You know, I think I just gave you the most opinion of a book I've ever given anyone in my life. <laughs> I think we just started a book club. That's yeah. what I think. <laughs> I think you and I are now in a, a Louise Penny book club. So now this is the very last bit of our conversation, which has gone on forever. I apologize for that, but what the hell? We had a lot to cover. That's okay. You know I love talking to you. (laughs) I love talking to you, too. Here's a question. Something you'd go back and tell yourself when you were 21. Read more. Louise Penny. (laughs) (laughs) See, I start the sentence, you complete it. That's a good one. What do you love about being your age? Is there anything you love about? Being 69? Um, there's there's a few things. Uh, four things in particular, which are my grandchildren. Oh. Um, they, they're the best. You know, it's it's as if you got through kids in order to get grandkids. You really? Know, it's that just, good? Oh, oh it's, it's better than best. Um, I'll tell you. How they're just they? such a joy. Four, uh, three, uh, almost two, and seven months. 
So do you see them all the time? I do. Well, three of them. And I see, you know, that my the oldest is in uh, New Jersey. So I know it's not a long way, but it, it tends to be when you want to see them all the of time. Of course. Yeah. Is there anything you wish you'd spent less time on? Oh. Besides shopping for pants? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've sort of lived my life the way I wanted to, I guess. <laughs> maybe I should buy a few shirts too. What do you think? I think maybe you should spend more time on shopping. I don't. I don't think I would. I. I can't imagine that I would have ever said this in one of these conversations. But I think it's time for you to really focus on shopping. Yeah, that's probably true. I think I have to come to Boston, and we're going somewhere. <laughs> Or you're That's a good to idea. Meet me in New York. Just, just bring your checkbook, you know. I'm, I'm just a government worker. <laughs> yeah, done and done. Sorry, ex-government exactly. worker. Exactly. <laughs> um, what are you looking forward to? Is there something you're looking forward to? Um, yeah, there's lots, I think. Um, I'm looking forward to spending more time with my kids. I think if there's any regret that I've had, it's that yeah, I think I could have spent more time with my kids rather than my work. Mm. Um, so I've missed some of that. But I don't know whether they feel that way. I'm sure they'd tell me if they did. <laughs> They're just about as shy as I am. Got it. Um, but I just want to relax a little bit. I'm I'm really looking forward. And I think I've done pretty well to just finding a way to chill and finding a way to get a little more exercise again. Swimming. Um, you got to go swimming. I've thought about that. I found a couple of um, swimming pools in the area, so I got to I got to get my butt in gear. Here. I started swimming recently. I have to tell you, I find it very meditative after a certain point. It getting going yeah. is, I, I mean, it's difficult for me anyway. It's hard, but then you get into a rhythm, and I just it's really good for the brain. I loved it. Well, I I was a lifeguard for years, like through college and stuff, and and I used to swim all all the time, every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved when you hit that moment that you're talking about. Yeah, you know when you all you can hear is your breath. It's unbelievable. It's really cool. It's proper meditation, is what it is. It, it really it is great. Plus, it's great swim. It's great exercise, especially when at my age. I think when we go shopping, we're getting you all sorts of. New pants and really lovely blouses, jackets, possibly a dress, and by the way, a new bathing suit. I feel that coming. <laughs> I, I will draw the line at bathing caps. I really don't like that look. <laughs> oh, then you don't want to come swimming with me because I, that is, I, let's just say it's the opposite of sexy. I don't know what the, what that word is, but that's what I am. <laughs> Gina, I can't uh, tell you how much fun this has been to hang out with you and talk. Oh, Julie, you know I love you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's great to spend time with you again. Likewise, likewise. I hope uh, I see you sometime soon. We'll make that happen. All right. Mwah. Big Bye. hug. Take care. Okay, we have to take a quick break right now. And when we come back, it's time to Zoom my mom. Making time during the week for a workout can be difficult. We don't always have time for a big scenic hike or a long ride on the trail. The truth is we may only have 30 minutes in between one thing and another. Peloton makes working out on a busy schedule so much easier because you don't even have to leave your house to jump right into a workout. One thing I keep hearing from the women I interview on Wiser Than Me is the absolute importance of finding and sticking to self-care routines. Finding fitness classes and workouts you actually enjoy is so important, and Peloton has so many options for classes and instructors to choose from. Staying fit is definitely important to me, and if it's important to you too, the Peloton tread is a really easy way to get your body moving. Peloton has classes and movements for every level, like the beginner boot camp, a power walk, or a high-intensity run. The instructors at Peloton are experts and are there to guide you with contagious energy and supportive instruction. Try Peloton Tread risk-free with a 30-day home trial, new members only, not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. 
Learning a new language can seem really intimidating, I know. For a lot of us, the last time we tried was in high school. But digging into Spanish or Italian or French doesn't have to feel like it felt in high school. It can be a really exciting and mind-opening experience, especially with Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app that has sold more than 10 million subscriptions. It's a fun and easy way to learn a new language. Their lessons are built around real life, so you learn how to have practical conversations about travel, relationships, business, and more. Babbel's bite-sized lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. I really appreciate how accessible all of the lessons are. Babbel clearly has figured out how to make learning invigorating through their podcasts, videos, and more. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. They've really thought of everything. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code WISER. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code WISER. Our sponsor article has a new way to shop for furniture. The days of in-person furniture shopping can be a thing of the past. Wandering around a huge store, perusing a limited selection, having to talk to a salesperson, and then trying to figure out how to get it all home. Like, man, I thought this would fit in the minivan. That's why Article is changing the game for how we shop. Summer is a perfect time to try Article out. I love this season, especially the idea of spending quality time outdoors with loved ones. And the right setup can ensure you have the perfect night every time, whether you're with your family, entertaining friends, or even just relaxing by yourself. The Article website is so easy to use. You can filter by the type of furniture, like patio filter, or by the room you're shopping for, or even by room bundles. Customers love browsing the bundles that Article curates. It's so easy, and we all love easy. They mix all the right pieces together for the right combination of design and functionality, like the perfect party trick bundle. That one is a definite eye catcher, but honestly, all of their bundles feature that same gorgeous curated touch and you'll likely feel inspired by more than just one. One more thing people love about the website is that every piece features a photo gallery from real customers so you can properly visualize what it might look like fitting into your space. You will love Article. They are a beautiful online furniture store with pieces that feature mid-century modern, coastal, and boho designs. It's simple, it's affordable, and it delivers right to your door. Article is offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash wiser, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash wiser for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Okay, I can't wait to talk to my mom about this conversation with Gina. I'm going to Zoom her right now. Mommy, can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. And I just dropped my uh, mouse. Okay. Do you want to get it? I can wait for you. And can you see me? I can see you, Mommy. Hold on two seconds. Let me just do this thing. Where's my little Zoom thing? Mommy, can you see me? I can see you. I can see your little postage stamp. Only a postage stamp? Yeah, because uh, I don't know what's happening. Well, your mouse is on the floor, for starters. No, I have it now. (laughs) Oh, you got it. Okay. All right. Good. Hi, Mom. Hi, hi, sweetheart. How are you? I'm good. I just talked to Gina McCarthy. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So are you are you smarter than ever? Ever. I am so smart. The big takeaway is that I'm gonna take Gina shopping because she doesn't she pays no attention to her clothes. She just uh-huh. buys pants that are cheap and a, and jackets that are cheap, and that's the end of it. I wonder if that's a bad way to go. No, I think it's probably, I think, talk about word to the wise. I think we should all probably be paying a lot less attention to shopping, although I'm saying that knowing that I don't believe a word that I just said. But you can talk about things that should be. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We can be aspirational. (laughs) Um, Tell me something. How did she get into the the work? Is Is she a scientist? No, she's not. Her career began in the 80s. She was the public health officer in Canton, Massachusetts. 
uh, outside of Boston. When did Gore first do The Inconvenient Truth? 2006. Oh, well, yeah. That's, what, okay, that's so. when it came out. So, you know, and, and remember you and I and Dowdy, we went and heard Gore speak well before it was the movie, and he was giving the talk about global warming. Okay, he, was, he was just on fire about it, uh, giving the talk. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly the environment and, and uh, climate change, and this is taking hold of more and more people, including the young people. And, and it has struck me, I remember so well during World War II, uh, the war effort. Yes. And how universal in this country the war effort was and how I did truly think if I bought those savings stamps and then I got my bond and then I gathered up my scrap metal and I took it to the collection place, I did truly think that that was going to help win the war. I mean, there was no question in my mind. And I was like, you know, eight years old. Yeah. There was a a fervor about it and it was universal. And I was thinking to myself, Jesus, I wish that the environment could take on that kind of mission where every single person thought every single thing that they did was crucial. Well, mom, maybe that's happening. Maybe that is, we are on the road towards that, you know? Yeah. And Uh it really speaks to a kind of a connectivity you felt to your community and to your country and to human beings was, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, it was, you were not alone and it spoke to that. Mm -hmm. And I think if the environmental messaging is correct, it can tap into exactly that fervor you're talking about, I think. Well, you know, here in our condo, we have a woman that's very much into energy and she has been a, she moved here about four years ago. And boy, she has taken off, you know, we're composting now. Of course, we've been recycling for a long time, but now she's gone over all kinds of energy things. She has a whole list of, if you leave a room uh, 15 minutes, you turn the lights off and that's one of the things. And then she has all kinds of other suggestions that are on the bulletin board. Mom, are is there resistance at all in the building to these suggestions? Well, there's resistance in that uh, certain people have made fun of her. Mm. You know, there she goes again. But now it, 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 you can tell at the meetings that she is front and center and she's she's intrepid and she doesn't give a, a crap about who loves her or who doesn't love her. She is here to make this this place more energy efficient. And um, you know, my hat's off to her. And, and you can tell that she gets listened to now and she talks a little bit less. You know, she she stands up and she says certain things because she's got us on on a certain track, and uh, she really gets listened to carefully. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear that. Uh, Gina McCarthy started going gray at the age of thirteen. Thirteen? Oh my gosh! I know, but she said she loved it. Yeah, right. Well, it's it's, it's so stunning when you're when you're young. Isn't That's what it? she said. She said it distinguished her. She because she has blue eyes and she had this beautiful gray hair. And she said it was like, it made her feel really special. She says now she doesn't feel special, but she, it's still very pretty. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Was that a hard decision for you to make that decision to go gray? Yeah, it was a huge uh, decision. Uh, And I planned to do it when I was 70, (laughs) but then somehow the the days went by and I I sort of got through my seventies. And then, and then I think it was a uh, uh, along around that when I was in my late seventies, that I said, I, I really was curious as to what was under there. Yeah, and, and I, I found a, a wonderful hairdresser who shepherded me along and helped me do it, and uh, was very encouraging, which is very important, you know, because it's a big change. I was happy I did it, but I still, you know, when I see pictures of myself as a brunette, I think, hmm, well, but well, you can always um, dye it back. <laughs> I like your gray hair, mommy. I think it looks fantastic. Yeah. I really do. I, thanks. Thanks, sweetheart. I, I'm glad I did it. And I, I've never, you know, I've never really seriously considered uh, going backwards. Yeah. So once you've done it, you've done once it. Once you've done it, you've done it. Well, I love you tons. And um, I, love you tons. I will uh, I'll talk to you later. Thank you for doing um, such, such good work for not only for your family and for the people that you love, but for the, all the people that you love in the world. Okay. Uh, you're welcome, world and mommy. <laughs> okay. I mean that too, honey. I really mean that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mom. Love, love you. you. Okay. Bye. Love you. Bye, Mom. 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 Okay. My mother didn't push leave. We're just looking at her desk top, possibly. 
Mom, can you hear me? Eh. Okay, hold on. I'm in a collar. Oh, brother. Mom? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Mom, you've, um, can you hear me? Okay, you've kept the zoom on on your computer. Oh. So if you can go back to your computer and I, now push. I, now I see you. Now I see you. I have not been able to get this like this before. Now I've okay. got to leave thing and all that stuff. So I'm leaving now. Okay, leave now. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, bye. <laughs> There's more Wiser Than Me with Lemonada Premium. Subscribers get exclusive access to bonus content. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Wiser Than Me is a production of Lemonada Media, created and hosted by me, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. The show is produced by Chrissy Pease, Alex McOwen, and Oha Lopez. Brad Hall is a consulting producer. Our senior editor is Tracy Clayton. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paula Kaplan, and me. The show is mixed by Kat Yore and Johnny Vince Evans, and music by Henry Hall. Special thanks to Charlotte Chrisman Cohen, and of course, my mother, Judith Bowles. Follow Wiser Than Me wherever you get your podcasts. And hey, if there's an old lady in your life, listen up. Hey, Wiser Than Me listeners, we want to hear from you. By just answering a few questions on our listener survey, you can share feedback about show content you'd like to see in the future and help us think about what brands would serve you best. And even better, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. The survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip and keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com slash survey. lemonadamedia.com slash survey.